Okay, so now let's start with an introduction to cognitive abilities. And the best way to start is to actually look at the anatomy of the brain. So this is just a very simplified schematic of the human brain. And as you can see, there are different portions of this brain. Now, there's lots and lots of detail here, lots of what we call sulci and gyri. So there's lots of folded cortex. And there's a reason why the brain does that. Do you guys know the reason? Why things are folded up? More surface area, exactly. If there's more surface area, it can accommodate a lot more, a lot more cells, a lot more connections, and it can fit a lot more within this reasonably sized skull of ours, but we can fit a lot more material in there. Now, this brain is organized into different lobes, so you can see here there's a frontal lobe. Okay, that's the, essentially what it sounds like. It's the frontal part of the brain. There's a parietal lobe. There's an occipital lobe and a temporal lobe four different lobes. And these lobes are replicated on both sides of the brain. So you actually have two frontal lobes, two parietal lobes, two temporal lobes, and two occipital lobes. We're going to go through those in detail and talk about each one's function and what happens when there's damage selectively to each one of those. There's also this little guy here, which we won't talk about too much, called the cerebellum. And cerebellum actually is Latin for little brain. Okay, And the cerebellum is, is in itself, a smaller version of the brain. It's got very, very tightly uh, 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 connected neurons and very, very small neurons or brain cells. And the functionality of the cerebellum, we understand some of it, and I'll talk about some of it today, but it's still, a lot of it is quite a mystery, uh, at least with, given our scientific state these days. So let's, let's start with something uh, a little bit more fun and exciting, and then we'll delve into the, the depth of the material. All right, so now we've covered the brain's innards, Let's think about outside. What about the cortex? What about all these gyri and sulci and so on? Let's talk about all of that. So the neocortex is organized actually incredibly well in terms of how things are all laid out. It's a really, really beautiful kind of appearance. So let's talk about that in detail. We have the occipital lobe in the back of the brain here that is involved in processing vision the analysis of visual information. Then we have the parietal lobe, which is just one step forward, and that's involved mostly in spatial cognition and spatial perception. So things like navigating around an environment, driving, drawing, doing things that require spatial skills will involve the parietal cortex. Also, the parietal cortex is really involved for directing your attention. And we're going to talk about specific kinds of damage where you have damage to certain regions in the parietal cortex, and the individuals that suffer from that kind of damage end up neglecting certain parts of their environment. It's an attentional problem, and these are very, very interesting syndromes, and we'll talk about them. Then if you move down a little bit, you will see the temporal lobe down here, and the temporal lobe's role is to process auditory information and to process language so there's Wernicke's area, for example, that sits right up top here. That's involved in processing language. And also processing memory. The hippocampus lives inside the temporal lobe. And we're going to talk about that in detail as well. And then finally, going forward, we have the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe has got the biggest mixture of things associated with it, but it's also the most complex. So in addition to controlling motor movements, so there's a motor cortex that is almost the very first thing that you look at when you're looking at the frontal lobe because it sits right here. And then everything forward from there is much more complex. Things like personality, IQ, decision-making ability, rationality, all of these things tend to be held or carried out in the frontal lobe or the frontal cortex. Now, this is one part of the brain that is overrepresented in humans compared to other animals. So if you ask me, for example, what's the difference between us and monkeys? I would say, well, our brains are actually largely similar. The only difference is we have a large frontal lobe and they don't. And that is the reason why we don't fling poop at each other, but they do. <laughs> right? We're, we're much more rational individuals. We have an ability to inhibit our impulsivity. Sometimes we might want to fling poop at each other, right? But, but something tells us, no, you need to stop. That's irrational and you might get arrested. Okay? But for a monkey, that doesn't happen. This is what they do freely all the time. It's kind of like a big celebration. This is just what they do. And it's because they don't have frontal lobes the size of ours. Okay? 
So now let's talk about sensory cortices, these strips right here, and how they're organized to represent different parts of your body. Now, there are what we call cortical homunculi, or the representation is the cortical homunculus. And homunculus physically means little man, and it's this little man. Now, this little man looks very, very strange because he is drawn to scale. The representation, or in other words, the over-representation of certain things like the fingers, the hands, the lips, the eyes, is a direct reflection of how much brain matter is devoted to these particular parts of the body and devoted to processing sensory and motor information in these parts of the body. So as you can imagine, I have a lot of fine motor skills in my fingers, but I don't have that kind of precision in the small of my back, right? Or in your knee. So that does not require a lot of representation. It requires maybe a smaller number of neurons, a smaller number of connections to be able to figure out, right? But with my fingers, with my tongue, with my face, my, all of the things that we do when we're talking, for example, all of these things require a lot of fine control, a lot of feedback, a lot of detail. And that's what you really see pictured here. You see lots of representation for fingers and hands, and lips, okay? And that's the representation that you see in the motor cortex and also in the sensory cortex. Lots of representation, kind of hard to see here with the, with the um, projector contrast, but lots of representation for things like the hands and the fingers and the tongue, same thing here, hands, fingers, tongues, and so on. That's normal, that's what it's supposed to do, and that's why if there's any particular kind of deficit <coughs> to hand movement and things like that, it requires actually a larger patch of cortex to be destroyed before a deficit can ensue. So we have a lot of representation for these things. And this is, this is evolutionary. This, we have evolved to become that way. So if you look, for example, at other species, if you look at a rat or a mouse or a squirrel, they have very different kinds of representation. They might have more acuity in their feet or they might have more acuity actually around their whiskers and for their olfactory sense, okay? because they tend to prefer to use different senses. So for humans and for primates in general, this seems to be the distribution. And a lot of this information was actually figured out by one individual, his name is Wilder Penfield. He did a lot of work up in Canada on this by doing surgery in patients where he was doing brain surgery. And at the time, in order to do surgery and, and remove different parts of the brain without hurting a whole lot of function, is you had to go around poking. You had to go around kind of pushing and saying, well, what do you feel? What do you feel? Can you still move your finger? And at what point do you stop feeling your finger? And so on. So by doing a ton of these experiments systematically, he was able to essentially map this cortical homunculus over many, many, many patients.